This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Phantom of the Opera by Gaston Leroux The Epilogue I have now told the singular but voracious story of the opera ghost. As I declared on the first page of this work, it is no longer possible to deny that Eric really lived. There are to-day so many proofs of his existence within the reach of everybody that we can follow Eric's actions logically through the whole tragedy of the Chagny. There is no need to repeat here how greatly the case excited the capital, the kidnapping of the artist, the death of the Comte de Chagny under such exceptional conditions, the disappearance of his brother, the drugging of the gas-man at the opera and of his two assistants. What tragedies, what passions, what crimes had surrounded the idol of Raoul and the sweet and charming Christine? What had become of that wonderful, mysterious artist of whom the world was never, never to hear again? She was represented as the victim of a rivalry between the two brothers, and nobody suspected what had really happened. Nobody understood that, as Raoul and Christine had both disappeared, both had withdrawn far from the world to enjoy a happiness which they could not have cared to make public after the inexplicable death of Count Philippe. They took the train one day from the northern railway station of the world. Possibly I, too, shall take the train at that station one day, and go and seek around thy lakes, O Norway, O silent Scandinavia, for the perhaps still living traces of Raoul and Christine, and also of Mama Valerius, who disappeared at the same time. Possibly some day I shall hear the lonely echoes of the North repeat the singing of her who knew the angel of music. Long after the case was pigeonholed by the unintelligent care of Monsieur le Juge d'Instruction Forêt, the newspapers made efforts, at intervals, to fathom the mystery. One evening paper alone, which knew all the gossip of the theatres, said, We recognize the touch of the opera ghost. And even that was written by way of irony. The Persian alone knew the whole truth, and held the main proofs, which came to him with the pious relics promised by the ghost. It fell to my lot to complete those proofs with the aid of the Daroga himself. Day by day I kept him informed of the progress of my inquiries, and he directed them. He had not been to the opera for years and years, but he had preserved the most accurate recollection of the building, and there was no better guide than he possible to help me discover its most secret recesses. He also told me where to gather further information whom to ask, and he sent me to call on Monsieur Poligny, at a moment when the poor man was nearly drawing his last breath. I had no idea that he was so very ill, and I shall never forget the effect which my questions about the ghost produced upon him. He looked at me as if I were the devil, and answered only in a few incoherent sentences, which showed, however, and that was the main thing, the extent of the perturbation which O.G., in his time, had brought into that already very restless life, for M. Poligny was what people call a man of pleasure. When I came and told the Persian of the poor result of my visit to M. Poligny, the Daroga gave a faint smile, and said, Poligny never knew how far that extraordinary blackguard of an Eric humbugged him. The Persian, by the way, spoke of Eric sometimes as a demigod, and sometimes as the lowest of the low. Poligny was superstitious, and Eric knew it. Eric knew most things about the public and private affairs of the opera. When Monsieur Poligny heard a mysterious voice tell him, in Box 5, of the manner in which he used to spend his time and abuse his partner's confidence, he did not wait to hear any more. Thinking at first that it was a voice from heaven, he believed himself damned, and then, when the voice began to ask for money, he saw that he was being victimized by a shrewd blackmailer to whom Debien himself had fallen a prey. 
both of them, already tired of management for various reasons, went away without trying to investigate further into the personality of that curious O.G., who had forced such a singular memorandum-book upon them. They bequeathed the whole mystery to their successors, and heaved a sigh of relief when they were rid of a business that had puzzled them without amusing them in the least. I then spoke of the two successors, and expressed my surprise that, in his memoirs of a manager, Monsieur Montchamin should describe the opera ghost's behaviour at such length in the first part of the book, and hardly mention it at all in the second. In reply to this, the Persian, who knew the memoirs as thoroughly as if he had written them himself, observed that I should find the explanation of the whole business if I would just recollect the few lines which Montchamin devotes to the ghost in the second part aforesaid. I quote these lines, which are particularly interesting because they describe the very simple manner in which the famous incident of the twenty thousand francs was closed. As for O.G., some of whose curious tricks I have related in the first part of my memoirs, I will only say that he redeemed by one spontaneous fine action all the worry which he had caused my dear friend and partner, and I am bound to say, myself. He felt, no doubt, that there are limits to a joke, especially when it is so expensive, and when the commissary of police has been informed, for at the moment when we had made an appointment in our office with Monsieur Mifroy to tell him the whole story, a few days after the disappearance of Christine Daae, we found, on Richard's table, a large envelope inscribed in red ink, with O.G.'s compliments. It contained the large sum of money which he had succeeded in playfully extracting, for the time being, from the treasury. Richard was at once of the opinion that we must be content with that, and drop the business. I agreed with Richard. All's well that ends well. What do you say, O.G.? Of course, mon chemin, especially after the money had been restored, continued to believe that he had, for a short while, been the butt of Richard's sense of humour, whereas Richard, on his side, was convinced that mon chemin had amused himself by inventing the whole of the affair of the opera ghost, in order to revenge himself for a few jokes. I asked the Persian to tell me by what trick the ghost had taken twenty thousand francs from Richard's pocket in spite of the safety pin. He replied that he had not gone into this little detail, but that if I myself cared to make an investigation on the spot, I should certainly find the solution to the riddle in the manager's office, by remembering that Eric had not been nicknamed the trap-door lover for nothing. I promised the Persian to do so as soon as I had time, and I may as well tell the reader at once that the results of my investigation were perfectly satisfactory, and I hardly believe that I should ever discover so many undeniable proofs of the authenticity of the feats ascribed to the ghost. The Persian's manuscript, Christine Daae's papers, the statements made to me by the people who used to work under Monsieur Richard and Montchamin, by little Meg herself, the worthy Madame Giry, I am sorry to say, is no more, and by Sorelli, who is now living in retirement at Louveciennes. All the documents relating to the existence of the ghost, which I propose to deposit in the archives of the opera, have been checked and confirmed by a number of important discoveries of which I am justly proud. I have not been able to find the house on the lake, Eric having blocked up all the secret entrances. Footnote 12. Even so, I am convinced that it would be easy to reach it by draining the lake, as I have repeatedly requested the Ministry of Fine Arts to do. I was speaking about it to Monsieur Dujardin Beaumetz, the Under-Secretary for Fine Arts, only forty-eight hours before the publication of this book. Who knows but that the score of Don Juan Triumphant might yet be discovered in the house on the lake? End of footnote 12. Continuing. On the other hand, I have discovered the secret passage of the Communists, the planking of which is falling to pieces in parts, 
and also the trapdoor through which Raoul and the Persian penetrated into the cellars of the Opera House. In the Communist dungeon I noticed numbers of initials traced on the walls by the unfortunate people confined in it, and among these were an R and a C. R. C. Raoul de Chagny. The letters are there to this day. If the reader will visit the opera one morning, and ask leave to stroll where he pleases, without being accompanied by a stupid guide, let him go to box five, and knock with his fist or stick on the enormous column that separates this from the stage-box. He will find that the column sounds hollow. After that do not be astonished by the suggestion that it was occupied by the voice of the ghost. There is room inside the column for two men. If you are surprised that, when the various incidents occurred, no one turned round to look at the column, you must remember that it presented the appearance of solid marble, and that the voice contained in it seemed rather to come from the opposite side, for, as we have seen, the ghost was an expert ventriloquist. The column was elaborately carved and decorated with the sculptor's chisel, and I do not despair of one day discovering the ornament that could be raised or lowered at will, so as to admit of the ghost's mysterious correspondence with Madame Giry, and of his generosity. However, all these discoveries are nothing, to my mind, compared with that which I was able to make in the presence of the acting manager, in the manager's office, within a couple of inches from the desk chair, and which consisted of a trap-door, the width of a board in the flooring, and the length of a man's forearm, and no longer, a trap-door that falls back like the lid of a box, a trap-door through which I can see a hand come and dexterously fumble at the pocket of a swallow-tail coat. That is the way the forty thousand francs went, and that also is the way by which, through some trick or other, they were returned. Speaking about this to the Persian, I said, So we may take it, as the forty thousand francs were returned, that Eric was simply amusing himself with that memorandum book of his. Don't you believe it, he replied. Eric wanted money. Thinking himself without the pale of humanity, he was restrained by no scruples and he employed his extraordinary gifts of dexterity and imagination, which he had received by way of compensation for his extraordinary ugliness, to prey upon his fellow men. His reason for restoring the forty thousand francs, of his own accord, was that he no longer wanted it. He had relinquished his marriage with Christine Daae, he had relinquished everything above the surface of the earth. According to the Persian's account, Eric was born in a small town not far from Rouen. He was the son of a master mason. He ran away at an early age from his father's house, where his ugliness was a subject of horror and terror to his parents. For a time he frequented the fairs, where a showman exhibited him as the living corpse. He seems to have crossed the whole of Europe, from fair to fair, and to have completed his strange education as an artist and magician at the very fountainhead of art and magic, among the gypsies. A period of Eric's life remained quite obscure. He was seen at the fair of Nijni Novgorod, where he displayed himself in all his hideous glory. He already sang as nobody on this earth had ever sung before. He practiced ventriloquism and gave displays of ledger domain so extraordinary that the caravans returning to Asia talked about it during the whole length of their journey. In this way his reputation penetrated the walls of the palace at Mazenderan, where the little sultana, the favorite of the Shah in Shah, was boring herself to death. A dealer in furs, returning to Samarkand from Nijni Novgorod, told of the marvels which he had seen performed in Eric's tent. The traitor was summoned to the palace, and the daroga of Mazenderan was told to question him. Next the daroga was instructed to go and find Eric. He brought him to Persia, where for some months Eric's will was law. He was guilty of not a few horrors, for he seemed not to know the difference between good and evil. 
he took part calmly in a number of political assassinations, and he turned his diabolical inventive powers against the Emir of Afghanistan, who was at war with the Persian Empire. The Shah took a liking to him. This was the time of the rosy hours of Mazenderan, of which the Daroga's narrative has given us a glimpse. Eric had very original ideas on the subject of architecture, and thought out a palace much as a conjurer contrives a trick casket. The Shah ordered him to construct an edifice of this kind. Eric did so, and the building appears to have been so ingenious that His Majesty was able to move about in it unseen, and to disappear without a possibility of the tricks being discovered. When the Shah in Shah found himself the possessor of this gem, he ordered Eric's yellow eyes to be put out. But he reflected that, even when blind, Eric would still be able to build so remarkable a house for another sovereign, and also that, as long as Eric was alive, someone would know the secret of the wonderful palace. Eric's death was decided upon, together with that of all the laborers who had worked under his orders. The execution of this abominable decree devolved upon the Daroga of Mazenderan. Eric had shown him some slight services, and procured him many a hearty laugh. He saved Eric by providing him with a means of escape, but nearly paid with his head for his generous indulgence. Fortunately for the Daroga, a corpse, half eaten by the birds of prey, was found on the shore of the Caspian Sea, and was taken for Eric's body, because the Daroga's friends had dressed the remains in clothing that belonged to Eric. The Daroga was let off with the loss of the imperial favor, the confiscation of his property, and an order of perpetual banishment. As a member of the royal house, however, he continued to receive a monthly pension of a few hundred francs from the Persian treasury, and on this he came to live in Paris. As for Eric, he went to Asia Minor and thence to Constantinople, where he entered the Sultan's employment. In explanation of the services which he was able to render a monarch haunted by perpetual terrors, I need only say that it was Eric who constructed all the famous trap-doors and secret chambers and mysterious strong-boxes which were found at Yildiz Kiosk after the last Turkish Revolution. He also invented those automata, dressed like the Sultan, and resembling the Sultan in all respects. Footnote 13 See the interview of the special correspondent of the Matin, with Mohammed Ali Bey, on the day after the entry of the Salonika troops into Constantinople, End of footnote 13. which made people believe that the commander of the faithful was awake at one place, when in reality he was asleep elsewhere. Of course, he had to leave the Sultan's service for the same reasons that made him fly from Persia. He knew too much. Then, tired of his adventurous, formidable, and monstrous life, he longed to be someone like everybody else, and he became a contractor, like any ordinary contractor, building ordinary houses with ordinary bricks. He tendered for part of the foundations in the opera. His estimate was accepted. When he found himself in the cellars of the enormous playhouse, his artistic, fantastic, wizard nature resumed the upper hand. Besides, was he not as ugly as ever? He dreamed of creating for his own use a dwelling unknown to the rest of the earth, where he could hide from men's eyes for all time. The reader knows and guesses the rest. It is all in keeping with this incredible and yet veracious story. Poor, unhappy Eric! Shall we pity him? Shall we curse him? He asked only to be someone, like everybody else. But he was too ugly, and he had to hide his genius, or use it to play tricks with, when, with an ordinary face, he would have been one of the most distinguished of mankind. He had a heart that could have held the empire of the world, and, in the end, he had to content himself with a cellar. Ah, yes, we must needs pity the opera ghost. I have prayed over his mortal remains 
that God might show him mercy notwithstanding his crimes. Yes, I am sure, quite sure, that I prayed beside his body the other day, when they took it from the spot where they were burying the phonographic records. It was his skeleton. I did not recognize it by the ugliness of the head, for all men are ugly when they have been dead as long as that, but by the plain gold ring which he wore, and which Christine Daae had certainly slipped on his finger, when she came to bury him in accordance with her promise. The skeleton was lying near the little well, in the place where the angel of music first held Christine Daae fainting in his trembling arms, on the night when he carried her down to the cellars of the opera house. And now, what do they mean to do with that skeleton? Surely they will not bury it in the common grave. I say that the place of the skeleton of the opera ghost is in the archives of the National Academy of Music. It is no ordinary skeleton. The End And now we come to a postscript on the Paris Opera House, which was the scene of Gaston Leroux's novel, The Phantom of the Opera. That Mr. Leroux has used for the scene of his story, the Paris Opera House as it really is, and has not created a building out of his imagination, is shown by this interesting description of it taken from an article which appeared in Scribner's magazine in 1879, a short time after the building was completed. The new opera house, commenced under the Empire and finished under the Republic, is the most complete building of the kind in the world and in many respects the most beautiful. No European capital possesses an opera house so comprehensive in plan and execution, and none can boast an edifice equally vast and splendid. The site of the opera house was chosen in 1861. It was determined to lay the foundation exceptionally deep and strong. It was well known that water would be met with, but it was impossible to foresee at what depth or in what quantity it would be found. Exceptional depth also was necessary, as the stage arrangements were to be such as to admit a scene fifty feet high to be lowered on its frame. It was therefore necessary to lay a foundation in a soil soaked with water, which should be sufficiently solid to sustain a weight of twenty-two million pounds, and at the same time to be perfectly dry, as the cellars were intended for the storage of scenery and properties. While the work was in progress, the excavation was kept free from water by means of eight pumps, worked by steam power, and in operation, without interruption, day and night, from March 2nd to October 13th. The floor of the cellar was covered with a layer of concrete, then with two coats of cement, another layer of concrete, and a coat of bitumen, the wall includes an outer wall built as a coffer dam, a brick wall, a coat of cement, and a wall proper a little over a yard thick. After all this was done the hole was filled with water, in order that the fluid, by penetrating into the most minute interstices, might deposit a sediment which would close them more surely and perfectly than it would be possible to do by hand. Twelve years elapsed before the completion of the building and during that time it was demonstrated that the precautions taken secured absolute impermeability and solidity. The events of 1870 interrupted work just as it was about to be prosecuted most vigorously, and the new opera house was put to new and unexpected uses. During the siege it was converted into a vast military storehouse and filled with a heterogeneous mass of goods, after the siege, the building fell into the hands of the commune, and the roof was turned into a balloon station. The damage done, however, was slight. The fine stone employed in the construction was brought from quarries in Sweden, Scotland, Italy, Algeria, Finland, Spain, Belgium, and France. While work on the exterior was in progress, the building was covered in by a wooden shell rendered transparent by thousands of small panes of glass. In 1867 a swarm of men, supplied with hammers and axes, stripped the house of its habit, and showed in all its splendor the great structure. 
no picture can do justice to the rich colors of the edifice or to the harmonious tone resulting from the skilful use of many diverse materials the effect of the frontage is completed by the cupola of the auditorium topped with a cap of bronze sparingly adorned with gilding farther on on a level with the towers of notre dame is the gable end of the roof of the stage a pegasus by monsieur le Cain, rising at either end of the roof and a bronze group by monsieur millet representing apollo lifting his golden lyre commanding the apex apollo it may here be mentioned is useful as well as ornamental for his lyre is tipped with a metal point which does duty as a lightning rod and conducts the fluid to the body and down the nether limbs of the god the spectator having climbed ten steps and left behind him a gateway reaches a vestibule in which are statues of Luli, Rameau, Gluck, and Handel. Ten steps of green Swedish marble lead to a second vestibule for ticket-sellers. Visitors who enter by the pavilion reserved for carriages pass through a hallway where ticket offices are situated. The larger number of the audience, before entering the auditorium, traverse a large circular vestibule located exactly beneath it. The ceiling of this portion of the building is upheld by sixteen fluted columns of Jura stone, with white marble capitals, forming a portico. Here servants are to await their masters, and spectators may remain until their carriages are summoned. The third entrance, which is quite distinct from the others, is reserved for the executive. The section of the building set aside for the use of the Emperor Napoleon was to have included an antechamber for the bodyguards, a salon for the aide-de-camp, a large salon and a smaller one for the empress, hat and cloak rooms, etc. Moreover, there were to be in close proximity to the entrance stables for three coaches, for the outriders' horses, and for the twenty-one horsemen acting as an escort a station for a squad of infantry of thirty-one men and ten sont gardes, and a stable for the horses of the latter, and besides a salon for fifteen or twenty domestics. Thus arrangements had to be made to accommodate in this part of the building about one hundred persons, fifty horses, and half a dozen carriages. The fall of the empire suggested some changes, but ample provision still exists for emergencies. Its novel conception, perfect fitness, and rare splendor of material make the grand stairway unquestionably one of the most remarkable features of the building. It presents to the spectator, who has just passed through the subscriber's pavilion, a gorgeous picture. From this point he beholds the ceiling formed by the central landing. This and the columns sustaining it, built of echelon stone, are honeycombed with arabesques and heavy with ornaments. The steps are of white marble, and antique red marble balusters rest on green marble sockets, and support a balustrade of onyx. To the right and to the left of this landing are stairways to the floor, on a plane with the first row of boxes. On this floor stand thirty monolith columns of sarancolin marble, with white marble bases and capitals. Pilasters of peach blossom and violet stone are against the corresponding walls. More than fifty blocks had to be extracted from the quarry to find thirty perfect monoliths. The foyer de la danse has particular interest for the habitués of the opera. It is a place of reunion to which subscribers to three performances a week are admitted between the acts in accordance with the usage established in 1870. Three immense looking-glasses cover the back wall of the foyer, and a chandelier with one hundred and seven burners supplies it with light. The paintings include twenty oval medallions, in which are portrayed the twenty danseuses of most celebrity since the opera has existed in France, and four panels by Monsieur Boulanger, typifying the war dance, the rustic dance, the dance of love, and the bacchic dance. While the ladies of the ballet receive their admirers in this foyer, they can practice their steps. Velvet cushion bars have to this end been secured at convenient points, 
and the floor has been given the same slope as that of the stage, so that the labor expended may be thoroughly profitable to the performance. The singer's foyer, on the same floor, is a much less lively resort than the foyer de la danse, as vocalists rarely leave their dressing rooms before they are summoned to the stage. Thirty panels with portraits of the artists of repute in the annals of the opera adorn this foyer. Some estimate may be arrived at by sitting before the concierge an hour or so before the representation commences. First appear the stage carpenters, who are always seventy, and sometimes when L'Africaine, for example, with its ship scene, is the opera, one hundred and ten strong. Then come stage upholsterers, whose sole duty is to lay carpets, hang curtains, etc. Gasmen, and squad of firemen, claqueurs, callboys, property men, dressers, coiffeurs, supernumeraries, and artists follow. The supernumeraries number about one hundred. Some are hired by the year, but the masses are generally recruited at the last minute, and are generally working men who seek to add to their meager earnings. There are about a hundred choristers, and about eighty musicians. Next we behold equerries, where horses are hoisted on the stage by means of an elevator, electricians who manage the light-producing batteries, hydraulicians to take charge of the waterworks in ballets like La Source, artificers who compare the conflagration in La Profeta, florists who make ready Margarita's garden, and a host of minor employees. This personnel is provided for as follows. Eighty dressing rooms are reserved for the artists, each including a small antechamber, the dressing room proper, and a little closet. Besides these apartments, the opera has a dressing room for sixty male and another for fifty female choristers, a third for thirty-four male dancers, four dressing rooms for twenty female dancers of different grades, a dressing room for one hundred and ninety supernumeraries, etc. A few figures taken from the article will suggest the enormous capacity and the perfect convenience of the house. There are 2,531 doors and 7,593 keys. Fourteen furnaces and grates heat the house. The gas pipes, if connected, would form a pipe almost 16 miles long. Nine reservoirs and two tanks hold 22,222 gallons of water and distribute their contents through 22,829 and two-fifths feet of piping. 538 persons have places assigned wherein to change their attire. The musicians have a foyer with 100 closets for their instruments. The author remarks of his visit to the opera house that it was almost as bewildering as it was agreeable. Giant stairways and colossal halls, huge frescoes and enormous mirrors, gold and marble, satin and velvet, met the eye at every turn. In a recent letter, Mr. André Castain, whose remarkable pictures illustrate the text, speaks of a river or lake under the opera house, and mentions the fact that there are now also three metropolitan railway tunnels, one on top of the other. This is the end of the final part of the book, The Phantom of the Opera.